All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeline or CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from the other coast in Brooklyn, New York by Yankel Meislin. How are you doing, Yankel? I'm great. Thank you, John. How are you? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and um, uh, Yankel, uh, you, you grow up a secular Jew, active in sports in your community until you uh, the streets called to you at 14 and you became a drug dealer. And at 19, we're selling high volume narcotics. Uh, you even had your own gang affiliated bodyguard. And after numerous attempts for your family to save you, you turned your life around when you were given an ultimatum to leave the life or be on your own. And you currently have 16 years of sobriety. That's excellent. And now you work with young men and adults to discover their true identity and ignite a spark for your clients to truly be themselves, uh, which is fantastic. So and what we're going to talk about is the 10 very specific ways we sabotage ourselves. Um, so, um, Yankel, um, let, let's get into it for a moment. Just going back to when you were on the streets, right? Sure. What, what was it? What was it at the time, as we get into how you sabotage yourself, how we sabotage ourselves, but what was it at the time that just attracted you to that life? So I think what, what it was that attracted me to the life was when, when I was younger, I was always uh, bullied. And so the control was out of my hands. And when you are a drug dealer the control is very much in your hands so mm -hmm. it was my kind of way of, of reclaiming the control that i felt that i lost from being bullied to now you know i'm in the driver's seat people need me they're calling my phone and they have to play by my rules mm -hmm. and i that was very attractive to me and, and then you add in to, on top of that the the power the money and everything else that comes with it and it's you know it, it was appealing intoxicating oh uh, and then okay so this this was one of the first obviously things that uh which you had to confront was like uh i guess feeling like you needed something external to yourself to be in control so you needed to be a drug dealer you needed to have this in order to feel some control in your life how did you start to turn that around when when the wheels fell off of everything and i lost total control and and i hit what they call you know um rock bottom and I, I really it was at a point where if i had continued on I, I probably wouldn't i probably would be in a mental institution i would probably have ended up in prison or or i would have ended up dead and mm. when i when i realized that those were my choices i i decided that i i've had enough mm. right? and that and then surrender takes over Right, 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 and that's and that's an interesting, interesting word, isn't it? Because uh, you know, surrender, you know, has connotations for surrender. Like it's it's the opposite; is giving up control, right? In many ways, <laughs> um, giving up control to get some control back. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Exactly. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about how do how do we sabotage ourselves? Because I, I mean, self sabotage is so prevalent, and, and you see it. And we're great at spotting it other, in other people. We're not so mm -hmm. great at spotting it in ourselves. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So, just to preface, this is not a my novel um, idea. I am taking this from a very famous New York Times bestselling book by a man named Shirzad Shamin. He wrote a book called Positive Intelligence, and this is his theory. So I'm going to interpret it the way that I understand, obviously, because I'm the one yeah. who's sitting in front of you. So he he basically lays out a, I don't know if I would call it a philosophy, but a, a way in which it appears our brains work. And based on science that he did lots and lots of research at in um, Stanford University, which is, you know, very well known school mm -hmm. on your side of the world yep. um he so he claims i don't like to well claims is not a good he posits that the way our brains work is we interpret an event and we have what what i would consider to be a gatekeeper surrounding our brain surrounding our experiences that 
helps us to interpret and figure out how to handle and deal with different scenarios which may or may not be foreign to us. And usually the way our brain works, if you were to split it into two almost, there's at, at the tip of my fingers it would be the, uh, like the point where we have a choice. But what, mm -hmm. what usually happens is it works in this way. We interpret the event, the event is somewhere up here, and we automatically go into uh, the left side of our brain, which is where our negative experiences, negative thoughts dwell, and that's where the saboteurs are. And it's almost in a way it, like a habitual um, sliding that we're not even aware is happening to us while we're experiencing these events. And this starts when we are young children, mm -hmm. because at that time, we really have no defense mechanism, no way to handle a novel event. We don't know how to deal with it. And the, the issue or the problem is that later on in life, when we are adults and we can theoretically handle it in a better way, we have already grown a very strong muscle that automatically sends us into the left side of our brain, the saboteur side. Mm -hmm. And 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 let's face it, I mean, the saboteur side, it masquerades as our protector, right? Because it's keeping us, it, it's keeping us from doing things. It's sabotage, you know, in order, and we think, oh, well, that's okay. That's, that's good because maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe it's right. Correct. Yes. And it all starts with the the gatekeeper, which or or otherwise known as the judge. So he will take three different sets of scenarios: the way that we look at ourselves, the way that we look at others, and the way that we see situations. And he will judge them as a negative thing, causing us to feel a negative emotion, and then activate a saboteur that you know each person has their own specific set that they prefer to use and and then we act through that so i'll give you an example let's say um let's say uh i'm i'm leaving my house this morning and my wife doesn't wish me goodbye so my judge interprets that as um you know my wife there's something wrong with my wife so i start judging her and then i get right. into a negative pattern and then um, there's something wrong with this situation. I am uniquely disadvantaged as a husband because my wife is the only wife in the world who doesn't wish her husband a, a good day and goodbye. And then that activates my victim saboteur. And then, you know, what's going to happen usually is that'll cause a uh, cascading effect to the rest of your day. So maybe you're driving to work and somebody cuts you off. And you respond in a way that, you know, it's almost foreign to you that you wouldn't do, like, you know, flipping the bird to, to the guy or mm -hmm. whatever, or cursing at them because, because your victim saboteur has been activated by your judge who told you, hey, your wife is uniquely horrible since she didn't wish you uh, to have a good day. Yeah. And isn't it fascinating, Yanko, like how incredibly good we are at appropriating and personalizing everything and relating it back to ourselves? So, you know, in the in the example like of your of your wife, maybe she's busy, maybe she's distracted. It's a whole host of things, but somehow you've managed to make it about yourself and and put a negative spin on it and then let it impact the rest of your day. Yeah, correct. 100 percent. And that is what is so um, uh, destructive about the saboteurs is that they're extremely self-centered and um, wanting to make everything about themselves, right? About mm -hmm. you, right? So the fact that your wife, that doesn't even come into their equation is that, you know, your wife is busy with other things. No, it must be about me because, mm -hmm. you know, that is the point. That's the whole that's the whole trick that they play. And they tell you, well, look, if, if I wasn't the one who was, you know, um, raising this stink within you, then how would you know that your wife was a bad wife? That's the mm. lie that they tell you, right? That right. Our, our mind tells us, this, our saboteurs mm. tells us. So how do you start to overcome them? So that's a good question. So it seems to me uh, that 
the reason that we get overtaken by our saboteurs is either because we are dwelling in the past and and this is you know this reminds me of something that happened to me when mm-hmm. i was little or something that i saw my mother do to her, to to my father and it deeply affected me or we are we are running our minds to the future and projecting on something that didn't even happen yet or like going to the logical extreme right so my wife doesn't mm-hmm. wish me to have a good day today that means that really she she hates me if you took it like all the way down to the logic to the illogical extreme of this of this fear that's bringing up the saboteur what what you'll notice is that nowhere in those two scenarios does the present moment exist Mm. right so when we have you know there's such a thing called an out-of-body experience but what about an in-body experience like how often do we really take the time to be truly, truly present in your body, right, right here, right now. Because if you were to really be fully present in your body, you would know that the guy who cut you off has nothing to do with the fact that your wife didn't say goodbye to you. And the fact that your wife didn't say goodbye to you has nothing to do with the fact that she doesn't love you. It's just that she was distracted and busy. But our mind starts running and telling us all of these lies that trigger the saboteurs to come up. And then Mm -hmm we are in victimhood for the rest of the day. And so, Jan, an well, interesting point, and it's something uh, that I think is getting even more acute, if you like, today. And just exactly what you said about being present, living in the moment, like being conscious in the moment, being intentional in the moment, all of that seems seems to be even more difficult today because we live in a world that kind of doesn't want you to do that. They want to distract you. You've got your TikToks, you've got everything, you've got your notes, you've got everything that's conspiring to make sure that you don't ever spend time in the present, that you don't ever spend time with yourself. Uh, and and I think that that's such a, you know, so how do, how, how do you actually, you know, Kind of push push aside the noise if you like, and really start to to start to embrace the present, be present. It's it's tricky because it it, it requ- it's like um almost like a an evil catch twenty two you know because on the one hand in order to break th- break past this cycle you have to be present enough to break past it, but in order mm-hmm. to be present enough to break past it, you have to break past it, right? So it's it's very difficult to um, pinpoint. But here, here's what I would say. If you notice that you are either one of, one of two things, you're either in a very negative mood a lot, or you are shutting your brain off completely, I, you know, vis-a-vis all of the social media that we, you know, have become so attached to. Mm-hmm then that might be a sign that there's something going on that would cause you to decide that you you want to break out of this cycle right 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 and i think that's a, I, I and i think that's a, yeah that's that's an interesting point is it like in order to be present you have to be present so you, it's almost like you have to make a conscious decision uh, with yourself and say i'm going to do this and it's not going to be overnight right but i'm going to start trying to uh live a little bit more in the present and not live uh, i think james joyce wrote in one of the book living at an arm's length from yourself which is where you're not in the present you're like either slightly in the future you're slightly in the past or whatever it is but but obviously that that comes with intentionality so if, if you want to change you have to make that choice and and being alone with your thoughts scary for a lot of people I, that is very true very very true and it actually while you were saying that it kind of reminded me of the way in which a, a, an alcoholic or a drug addict gets sober. You know, they're in the same kind of catch-22 because in order to be sober, you have to get sober. But in order to yep. get sober, you have to want to stop doing the drugs, right? So mm-hmm. it's the same similar catch-22 of, of the addictive nature of getting out of yourself and not, and not being present. So, mm-hmm. you know, in certain circumstances, some people really need to hit rock bottom to get to gain that moment of clarity. But if if you're not at that stage where that's what you need to do, then, you know, it might, it might be a worthy, yeah. a worthwhile thing to look into is to, to figure out how to, how to become present, even though it's mm-hmm. scary, even though it's can be dark or whatnot, but 
the the health benefits to your mental state and even to your physical state is innumerable. Yeah. And what are some of the other ways that we sabotage ourselves? So starting off with the judge, right? That is the one, like I said before, judging mm -hmm. the three scenarios. And then he might activate in you, depending on what kind of person you are and your personality, your particular traits. He might he might bring up the controller, let's say. That is for people who, you know, as the name states, has to be in control of all situations and scenarios. So, you know, how that affects them is that it that's very tiresome, you know, to be mm -hmm. in that state all the time is very tiresome. And then on top of that, the people around you feel like they basically have no free will. So yeah. it's it doesn't really help you all that well. That's number one. Number two is hyper rational. That would be like a person who lives very specifically in the um, logic of things and always looking for, you know, some kind of argument or you know, uh, logic out of everything. Yeah. That is the ultimate. There's nothing better. But what happens to that person is, is that that also gets very tiresome to live in that way all the time. You're, there's no emotions involved whatsoever. And all you do is just live in logic. So it happens to be that that one is one of my top saboteurs and my wife can't stand that saboteur. You know, when <laughs> I get hijacked by that one, and she's like trying to get me to understand her emotions and I'm trying to get her to understand logic. And we're just, it just doesn't work together. Right. Like mm -hmm. I, I can't, that, so that is the negative effect that that particular saboteur has on the people around them. Then there is the, um, the hyper achiever. So that's mm -hmm. uh, very common among Americans. That's people who are constantly looking for the next achievement right so yeah. i'll give you a perfect example right last night the boston celtics won the nba finals right so the hyper achiever says okay we just won what about next year yeah right so they're already there they can never really rest within themselves because they're already on to the next thing and so it it never allows for a, a, a moment of rest mm. and that can be that that is very you know um we've kind of been taught that way but it's it's very draining yeah. and, and it is. I, mean, I, I feel sometimes Jankel, is that um, as you said i mean we don't stop for a moment to celebrate and, and achievements you know regardless of whether they're big small or whatever uh, but we we never stop because you're right we're always on to the next we're always on to the next thing which then means that there's always some level of dissatisfaction there right exactly exactly because okay so i won yesterday but now what about tomorrow mm -hmm. right there's it never ends. So that's mm -hmm. that. And uh, so that's the hyper achiever. Then you have the hyper vigilant, who is mm -hmm. the type of person who is always on guard, right? So it's like you ever meet a person who you just say hello to them, and they think you're trying to sell them something or something like that. Like, that's the type yeah. of person they're always hyper aware of what's going on around them to the point where they never are really allow themselves to, um, to trust anyone or anything because yeah. they're always afraid that you're you're out to get me in some way shape or form yeah. that's the hyper vigilant yeah isn't that, have... one, isn't that one, isn't that one isn't that one interesting though yankel just because again it's like human nature so funny isn't it like we're hardwired for these neg to go down these negative paths if, unless we confront them right like the you know the hyper vigilant you know uh, like always looking for okay how is this what's going to happen or oh i don't know that's that looks like that could be dodgy or whatever but i mean that's like all of these that's exhausting right 100 percent. and and the interesting thing about them is is that there is a there is a converse side to them where these things can be used in a positive way right, right. like it's it's a very good thing to to have a healthy dose of skepticism about yep. you know somebody approaches you and says listen yankel i have the deal of the century for you you're gonna make you're gonna give me a hundred bucks and i'm <laughs> gonna turn it into a hundred thousand right like mm -hmm. uh, okay yeah that obviously to be on guard for something like that is is a good thing right yeah. but when you overuse it and it becomes part of your who you are daily with any of them that is when it really becomes a, a big problem or, mm -hmm. or can be become a big yeah. problem um okay so that's the hyper vigilant after the hyper vigilant you have the victim who is constantly in a state of victimhood 
And that is obviously not a healthy way to live because no matter where you go or who you're with or what the scenario is, you are always going to be the victim and nobody can really ever make you feel good. Mm -hmm. And it, that's a really exhausting way of living and an exhausting, you know, if you've ever known somebody who lives in that space, it's, it's really difficult to, you know, remain close to them because they're constantly feeling like feeling victimized and, you know, you can never yeah, make them feel good. Yeah. And for them, obviously, the when you have that victim mentality, then nothing is your fault. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it may be miserable, but at least you can go, well, it's not my fault. It's because I'm a victim. Right. And therefore, you're just leaving yourself sitting in victimhood. Yeah, 100 percent. And that, you know, but then also the, the, the bad part of that is that people feel like you never take responsibility for anything you ever do. And so I don't exactly. really want to be around you anymore. So that's exactly. the that's the victim. Then there is also the stickler, which is the the type of person who has to have everything be perfect. And mm -hmm. the way that that presents itself within their own life is is pretty self obvious, but it, it really manifests in all kinds of different ways. Like the, you know, the house has to be set up in a very specific way. And if the kid comes along and moves the the tchotchke off the table by three centimeters, it's a big problem. And so being around that type of person for, for their immediate circle can be very draining and mm -hmm. exhausting because you can't ever please them. Well, you can't. And that's phrase it. And perfection is unattainable. So it's all, it's, I always feel like, you know, when you, people talk about being perfectionist or this, what it really is, is it's a mechanism for avoidance because you can never have anything perfect. So that means you always have an ex excuse not to deliver, not to finish something, not to do something because it's not quite right. That's a good point. And that actually brings me to the next saboteur, which is the avoider who mm. is the habitual procrastinator. So for that type of person, you know, uh, it's very difficult for them to get anything started. Everything feels very overwhelming. And so what would they rather do is they'd rather push it off for later. And that can have a, that it also can play out in like um, interpersonal relationships where they don't want to have that confronting conversation because they'd rather avoid it. So yeah, yeah. for them in themselves, it's, it, you know, nothing ever gets done. And then for the people around them, I'm not really sure if you're being real with me because you're always yeah. avoiding that difficult conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's the thing. I, and I think that's become more and more prevalent, if you like, because, again, if we go back to popular culture and all of that out there, everything is telling you, you know, oh, you don't need to do to avoid any any anything anything uncomfortable anything whatever you know avoid all of that so it's i feel like we're almost creating a a we're creating more avoiders out there because we're saying like you should never be uncomfortable so just avoid any situation that makes you that yeah uh, i'm i'm with you on that 100 <laughs> yeah, percent. absolutely and, and have you been writing these down because i lost count of how many we're at um let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine i think we're at the last one okay the last one is the restless the restless yeah. is the type of person who goes from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing because they can never fully be focused on one one area they always are like uh what is that that's syndrome of like a missing a FOMO. They always think they're FOMO, missing yeah. out on something even better than what they're doing right now. Yeah. So for that particular person, you know, they can never just rest. And, and this, I, I would, I would posit is perhaps um, part of what becomes like uh, sex addiction and, and things of that nature, because, you know, they're never really happy with what they have in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, for a person who's around that, it's like totally exhausting, you know, to be yeah. friends with a person who's restless because nobody can ever keep up unless you're also exactly like <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I feel like, again, I mean, I feel like that's, uh, I mean, it's almost promoted today, isn't it? Like, you know, to be dissatisfied, to be always like looking for the next thing and, you know, and, and people probably aren't, aren't conscious, really conscious about the fact, I mean, their social media feeds are full of people telling them, oh, you know, be the best, you know, you're not the best version of it. You could make more money. You could do this, you could do that. And so I'm sure if you already have a propensity towards that, uh, you know, towards being a kind of restless kind of person, then I'm sure like social media must just try put you into overdrive. Yeah, it definitely can has can have the effect of of 
really maximizing the the ill effects of that. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, most people have a sort of ingrained way of how they are, you know, the way that they were born, you can see uh, with mm-hmm. different children, you know, even from the from a very, very, very young age, they have a certain propensity yep. towards one or the other. Like my oldest daughter is is a controller and my son has a very different saboteur, you know, the one born after after her and and so on and so forth. I have six children and I can see that it, and all, all of them have a different way of of showing up as their go to. Yeah. No, it's it's fascinating. Well, listen, um, Yankel, this has been completely fascinating. Um, all of Yankel's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. So I I coach young men and, and older gentlemen on how to recognize their saboteurs and how to beat their saboteurs, particularly when it comes to how they show up in their in their place of business how they show up at home you know in and how mm-hmm. with their with their families and or their private lives and figuring out a way to use the the good parts of the saboteurs the converse mm-hmm. parts of the saboteurs to really amplify the the best parts of the person and utilize that and have a positive effect in the world yeah, listen, fantastic. Listen, this has been so fascinating. I go uh, encourage you to go check out uh, Yankel's work. Uh, thank you for watching and listening, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Yeah.